so talking about the autonomic nervous system, we've got the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic is for flight or flight response. Parasympathetic is for the rest and repose response. So sympathetic will speed up the heart. Parasympathetic will slow down the heart. The sympathetic component of the autonomic nervous system that deals with the heart is the cardioacceleratory center. It's found in the medulla oblongata and it uses the adrenalines essentially and beta-1 adrenergic receptors. Um, also, there's something called the Bainbridge reflex. Um, the Bainbridge reflex is something where you have um, these baroreceptors down here. Um, I have that written down. These atrial baroreceptors, which sense pressure in the right atrium. So when you get an increase of pressure in the right atrium, meaning that you have a lot of venous return, um, which is just how much blood is going back into the heart, which it always enters into the right atrium when it's coming back from the body. So a lot of blood coming back into the heart from the body, kind of getting stuck up in the right atrium. You don't want it to just be, um, you know, pulling there and causing this high pressure there because then it's going to be impossible to bring blood back up from the body with this high pressure in the right atrium. So you want to flush it through. So what happens with this Bainbridge reflex is these atrial baroreceptors sense that high blood pressure in the right atrium and they trigger the cardioacceleratory center to speed up the heart. Oops, cardioacceleratory center. It speeds up the heart and it pushes that blood through um, into the right ventricle, out through the pulmonary circuit, and then eventually out through the left side. Um, into the aorta, back out into the systemic circuit um, in order to just get it out of that right atrium. So that's the Bainbridge reflex. Um, the parasympathetic nervous system, this is for slowing down the heart. It uses the cardioinhibitory center, which also in the medulla oblongata, and it uses acetylcholine, which binds to M2 muscarinic receptors on the cardiac muscle where um, the um, M2 muscarinic receptors, if you remember from AMP1, that's inhibitory. It um, uses phosphodiesterase to break down camp, which slows down the heart. It inhibits the heart. Um, so acting opposite of each other. Now these are responding not just to the Bainbridge reflex, but they're responding to information from baroreceptors or pressure receptors and chemoreceptors, um, sensing um, oxygen, carbon dioxide, pH. Um, and they will affect whether we're stimulating the um, cardioacceleratory center or the cardioinhibitory center. So for the baroreceptors, we have the carotid and aortic sinuses, um, which are found in the carotid arteries and in the aorta, and then those atrial baroreceptors, which we already saw. For the chemoreceptors, we have the carotid, aortic, and medullary bodies. Um, again, in the carotid, in the aorta, this one in the brain, so the base of the brain, um, arteries going up to the base of the brain. So these are responding to chemical um, stimuli, particularly carbon dioxide and pH. That's going to be the most important chemical stimulus that they respond to. And then secondarily to oxygen um, levels. So let's say you have a lot of carbon dioxide in your blood and your pH has gone low because of it. You want to trigger the cardioacceleratory center to speed up the heart, which pushes blood past the lungs faster so you can exhale, do that hyperventilation that, that, um, that, that, uh, uh, I lost the word, the, the pulmonary, um, um, ventilation to, to get the cardio or to get the carbon dioxide out of the lungs, respiratory compensation. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, so you speed up the heart to do that. Um, and that would fix your pH and carbon dioxide problems. Now for the baroreceptors, if you have high blood pressure, you are going to sense it using these. So not so much these. We already talked about how that has the Bainbridge reflex with this. Um, these two up here are going to sense high blood pressure and they will stimulate the cardioinhibitory center to slow down the heart to reduce your blood pressure. If you have low blood pressure, then they're going to want to do the cardioacceleratory center. Okay, so our next topic then has to do with volumes in um, 
the heart, things that are moving in and out of the heart, or um, especially in the ventricles, we'll be focusing on. So we have an end diastolic volume, which can be abbreviated as EDV. There's an end systolic volume, which is ESV. The stroke volume, which is SV. And cardiac output, which is CO. So the end diastolic volume is how much blood you have left in the ventricles at the end of their diastole. That's why it's called the end diastolic volume. So it's essentially how much blood did you fill the ventricles with. Um, the end systolic volume is how much blood is left over after the ventricles have gone through systole, so after they've injected the blood. That's why it's called end systolic blood. It's how much blood is there at the end of systole. So this is how much you fill it with. This is what's left over, what you couldn't get out when you ejected it. Um, how much you ejected it is your stroke volume. So how much blood you ejected with the contraction is the stroke volume. So how much you filled it with minus what's left over um, after you're done ejecting will give you the stroke volume. So let's say we had an end diastolic volume of let's say 140 and then we had an end systolic volume of um, let's say 50. So that would give us a stroke volume of 90 um, milliliters. Okay, so very simple, basic math. If I can do it in my head, anybody can do it in their head. Um, so just so that you see the relationship of those. Um, now the cardiac output would just be how much blood you pump out each minute. So how much is ejected each time, the stroke volume, times how many times it actually does it, which would be your heart rate. So here we had a stroke volume of 90 milliliters. That's kind of a high stroke volume there. Um, and let's have a heart rate of 60 beats per minute. So multiplication tables, <laughs> um, that 55, 40, right? I think um, that would be your um, cardiac output in this case. So th these are not really typical sorts of numbers, they're a bit high. Um, now, there's something called the preload or the Frank Starling principle. Um, this has to do with how much you're filling the ventricles. If you think of, um, you know, a muscle, here's a chamber, it's just a chamber made of muscle. If you fill it really, 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 really overly much, you're going to be putting a lot of pressure on the walls, really stretching it, so just pushing out on it and stretching it, those muscles aren't going to be able to get a good grab. They're not going to be able to, um, you know, have enough um, tension production in order to get a good contraction. Just think of like when you put too much food in your mouth and, you know, you've really filled your mouth like way, way, way too much and you're having trouble chewing. Kind of like that sort of idea. Um, it's also the idea of from, um, you know, exercise science and, and what you would have learned in AMP1 about the um, optimal range of motion. Where if you overstretch your sarcomeres, they just, they can't get enough grab. Your actin and your myosin don't have enough room to interact, so you can't create that tension. But if you understretch them, then they don't really have enough room to move in the first place. So each exercise would have you know, this, this optimal range of motion where you don't want to, let's see if we can get my arm in, I'll well, use my hand. So like if we're, if I'm just kind of doing this motion, it's better that way. If I'm trying to like go like that, I'm too contracted already. I'm not going to get a lot of exercise out of that. But if I hyperextend my hand, I'm not able to, you know, I wouldn't be able to lift a weight really well if that weight was on my hand. It would be hard to get it up there. But I would have the most strength with my hand coming from this position where I have enough room to move and I have enough um, overlap between my actin and my myosin to get some tension. So it's the same idea here, and the stretch in this case is caused by filling. So if you overstretch, then you can't get enough grab, you can't create enough tension. If you understretch, um, you just don't really have anywhere to go. So you want to fill the, um, the ventricles just enough. You want to fill them so they're not overstretched, and you want to fill them so they're not understretched, and you can get the most efficient ejection. So, um, 
optimal filling would cause you to have the most efficient contraction. And injection, which is good. You want your heart to work um, not overly hard. You want it to work, you know, efficiently and just the right amount. Okay, so let's put this together in a big picture sort of way. So let's look at an EKG, um, which you're going to be doing in lab. If you haven't already done it, you'll be doing it soon. Um, so it's good to know what you're looking at before you start to actually look at it. And I've just drawn up here um, the action potential for one cardiac muscle cell. So this would be the electrical activity in one cardiac muscle cell. Down here is an EKG, and this would be happening in all the cardiac muscle cells. So it's measuring the electrical activity of a whole bunch of these at the same time. So let's just learn the parts of it, and then we'll say exactly what's happening and, and figure that out from there. So we've got the P wave. Then there's QRS, called the QRS complex, and then the T wave. Then you have this period of time where, where everything's you know, nothing's happening, nothing's depolarizing or repolarizing at all. That's called diastasis. It's where all the chambers are just relaxed. And then you go into another cardiac cycle with the P wave, QRS, and the T. And each one of these, you know, this here, from P to T, this is, would be a cardiac cycle. So one heartbeat, another heartbeat, and so on, for as long as you're alive and your heart is beating. So what P is representing? It's a measure of the electrical strength of the depolarization of all the cells in the atria. So when P is happening, as we start to go up with P, we're going up, all the cells in the atria are doing this. They're all depolarizing. And as we continue on with P, they're continuing on with their action potential. So we're depolarizing here. We haven't contracted yet. Remember, the contraction happens like from here to here. So there's going to be a little bit of a lag time from when we start depolarizing to when we actually have the contraction or when we actually have atrial systole. So atrial systole happens kind of mid-P, and it will end right about as we hit the Q. Um, now QRS is showing all of the ventricles doing this. So as we start going up, we're going up. All the ventricle um, heart muscle cells are going up, they're depolarizing, so all of them together, so from Q to R, they're depolarizing. At R, they've hit the peak of their action potential, and then as we continue on through S, they're continuing on through all of this. So again, the contraction doesn't just like, boom, oh, we depolarized, we've contracted, there's a little bit of a lag time, so the actual contraction doesn't happen until about S to T, maybe somewhere on the downslope between R and S it might start. But the actual ejection of the blood, the moving of the blood, is happening between S and T. Um, now, while this is happening, the atria are repolarizing. So they're going down through this end stage of their action potential. You just can't see it because the ventricular signal is so much stronger because they're so much bigger than the atria. So it's just kind of obliterated or hidden by um, the ventricles there. And then when we get into T, that's when the ventricles are repolarizing, so they're going into diastole, they're going down here, all of the cells are going through this. Okay, Okay. so there is a diagram that we're about to get to, and this diagram is the last on your slides, I think it's the last slide on your PowerPoint slides. But I just want to reiterate really quickly before we get into this, because this diagram makes people unhappy sometimes, but we don't need to be unhappy about it. It's not as bad as it looks at first sight. It's just showing what you already know in diagram form. So if you think of blood filling into the atrium, we'll just do the, the right side for now just to keep things easy. So the blood is coming into the atrium and, and that's going to kind of increase pressure in the atrium a little bit because you're filling it. You know, it's like a water balloon. You fill the water balloon and pressure on the side of the balloon gets a little bit more. But the blood is also going to trickle down into the ventricle as we're filling the atrium because just gravity. So we kind of increase the volume a little bit with this sort of passive trickling, this passive flow as we're filling. So let's say we're in this diastasis period. So, um, you know, 
we're just having passive filling happening right now. Nothing is contracting. So the blood is going to kind of increase the pressure a little bit, increase the volume a little bit um, inside these chambers. Then as we go into atrial systole, the atria squeeze and they really push the blood in to the ventricles. So we're really increasing the volume. Let's say it was down here from passive filling. We really increased the volume um, of the ventricle. So we're going to have a lot more volume and that puts a bit of pressure. So we start increasing the pressure a little bit more in the ventricle. Then as we get into QRS, particularly as we start to contract, so around S and T, so maybe a little bit before S, but definitely by S, those ventricles are squeezing now. So the pressure gets really, really, really high. The pressure is going to really increase because they're squeezing. And then um, ejection happens and the blood goes out. So there's my rendition of the pulmonary trunk coming out that way. Blood goes up there. Okay. Um, and then we would reduce the volume because the blood's all going out. It's moving, moving away from the ventricle and into the pulmonary trunk. Um, there's another thing. Let's, let's draw just this side by itself. So the left side. So we fill the ventricle. I'm just focusing now on the ventricle. We do passive filling. Then we do active filling when the atria contract. Um, increase the volume. Um, a bit more and increase the pressure a little bit and then when the ventricle goes into systole we really increase the pressure um, and now from the left side the blood is meant to go up into the aorta but if you remember we have this valve sitting here at the base of the aorta same with the pulmonary trunk it's not quite as dramatic in effect so that's why I wanted to show you on the aorta the last time the ventricles contracted the blood went up it was ejected into the aorta it went up a lot of it, most of it would then go down and out throughout the whole body, but any blood, when this ventricle stopped contracting, any blood that hadn't made it up over that hook yet is just going to fall back down again because there's no more pressure pushing it up out. You know, I think of like when you have like a, a straw in a cup, which we shouldn't have straws in cups anymore because, you know, sea turtles, <laughs> so think of that, but like let's say a reusable straw in a cup and you squeeze that cup and some of the stuff comes up out of the straw like whatever's in your glass comes up out of the straw but when you stop squeezing that cup whatever was left in the straw just falls right back down again but then also imagine a valve um, that is preventing it from falling all the way back down into the cup it's just stopping it at the base of the straw so you essentially have this little pool of blood sitting there on top of that um, aortic valve just sitting there and then you have ejection happening again so you contract and the blood starts to push against that valve but it's got to overcome that weight it's got to pop that blood up so enough to pop open the valve so there's like this building of pressure building of pressure but no blood is moving and then the pressure becomes enough to push open that valve and up goes the blood all of it through the aorta again so that's what this diagram is showing um, so I've kind of taken out what I think are the most important parts of the diagram. There's, there's a little bit of noise on the diagram, so I just took out the parts where I want to focus on. Um, there's the EKG, then the blue line is the ventricular volume, and the red line is the ventricular pressure. So we've got P, which is atrial depolarization, which leads to atrial systole halfway through P to Q. We have QRS, that's ventricular depolarization, which leads to ventricular systole um, between S and T. Um, and then we also have atrial repolarization happening there. And then we have T, which is ventricular repolarization. So that's where we're relaxing. Then we have diastasis happening here, which is just passive filling. And that passive filling will occur until we hit atrial systole again, so midway through P to there, and then we'll have active filling of our ventricle. So just follow along here. Here's the volume, so how much blood we have in the ventricles. So we're just passively filling, we're passively filling, so the volume's going up a little bit, and then we have atrial systole happen, so we increase the volume quite a bit. We're dramatically filling the ventricle. Now atrial systole stops, we stop contracting, so right about Q, I didn't quite aim that line perfectly, but right about Q, the atria stopped contracting, and now the ventricles 
are going in too systole, but we're not worried about their pressure yet. We're just worried about their volume. So here, this flat spot where the volume isn't changing, we're not filling the ventricle anymore because atrial systole has stopped. We're not doing passive filling because the ventricles are starting to squeeze, um, but they're not ejecting yet either. So the pressure is going up here, but the volume isn't changing because we haven't popped open that aortic valve yet and the pulmonary valve too. We haven't reached enough pressure. So pressure increases, volume stays the same. It's just this flat spot. And this is called isovolumetric contraction. Iso means the same, volumetric means volume. So it's a contraction that's happening, but the volume is staying the same. Or another word for it is isovolumic contraction. It's just whichever term you like better. Um, then the pressure gets to be enough to overcome the pressure of what's already in the aorta, what's already in the pulmonary trunk to pop open those valves. Here comes ventricular ejection starting right around that S. So the volume goes down. And then at some point, it goes flat again. That looks like it's going up. It's really just staying flat. My drawing skills are not so good. So just the same volume, volume not changing. What's happening here is that the ventricles are relaxing, but they are not able to start filling yet. So we're not able to start our passive filling phase where the volume will slowly go up gently. Um, need to tilt that a little bit so it looks like it's going up. Um, and the reason why the volume isn't increasing yet, why we can't passively fill yet, is because the ventricles haven't fully relaxed. There's still too much pressure inside for um, for them to start filling, for water, or for, not water, for blood to start moving into them. So that would be sort of the opposite of isovolumetric contraction. It's isovolumetric relaxation. So pressure hasn't quite decreased enough yet for filling to start. And then it does, and we start passive filling all over again, and the same thing. Okay, now last thing, the ventricular pressure. This is going to be increased when we fill to a small extent, but it's going to really increase when we contract. So here, as we're passively filling, not too much of an increase of pressure, just a little bit of an increase in pressure. Um, now when we fill it actively with the atria contracting, so during atrial systole, the pressure increases a nice amount, still not that much, but a little bit. And then we start to contract. So right around the peak of the action potential, a little bit past um, our, like where the ventricles are, like in the peak of their depolarization, they're going to start their contraction. And we get this really, really high increase in their, um, their pressure because they're contracting. So this probably should be kind of, well, right around the T. Yeah, that lines up okay. So the peak of this should be right before um, the T. So that's where we're going to be creating enough pressure to cause ejection. And then the pressure as the ventricles start to relax, remember they're repolarizing at T so that they're going into diastole and the pressure decreases and decreases. And then we start our passive filling again and slowly. So the same thing going on. So that's really all that diagram is. On the diagram, they also have a couple of spots where they have like the, the heart sounds. We'll worry about that for lab. If you want to worry about it now, there is a video posted um, for um, heart sounds and blood pressure, which goes over where you would find the heart sounds, but it isolates the heart sounds on their own along with the EKG, which makes it a little bit easier to look at. Um, so that, that's really it, essentially. That's it. Um, the only other thing, maybe think about aortic pressure. The take home message, I don't want to draw it on here because it's not going to be that exciting. The only thing that is um, really of interest here is that aortic pressure is highest um, just after ventricular ejection. Which just makes sense as you're ejecting. So as the blood is leaving the ventricle, it's going into the aorta. So, of course, the pressure is going to be highest in the aorta because the volume is higher in the aorta. And then it's going to drop as the blood goes down over that little hook of the aorta and it goes out through the rest of the, you know, the vessels that lead out of the aorta. The pressure and the volume in the aorta will go down. Okay, okay and that is it.